Welcome to an episode of I Know I Know, a Solo Beatles podcast where we talk all things Solo Beatles. Um, I am your host, your only host, Hudson Ranny, and today we have a very, very special guest. And th- this is top tier. He is he is the guitarist. He was the guitarist for Etta James. He also has played guitar with this guy named Paul. Um for the last 20 or so years. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks so much, Hudson. How are you doing today, man? I'm great. It's cold and nice in Vermont, and I'm sure it's a lot better in California. It's a, it's a little gray, but uh, yeah, it's, I'll give you that. It's probably a little warmer here than it is in Vermont. Yeah. Good to meet you. It's it's great to meet you, too. Um, I was very, so excited. I like ran out of class. because I was like, oh, I'm going to talk to Brian. <laughs> You got to stay in school. Yeah. Don't skip school. <laughs> now, Brian, I want to go back in time to when, when did you first like get into music? Well, you know, when I was a little kid, uh, I, 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 uh, got introduced to music by a half sister of mine named Jean. And she was from a previous marriage to my father. She was 15 years older. She was now in high school. And she was, of course, infatuated with this new rock and roll thing. This is back in the day, you know. And uh, so she would take me to her girlfriend's house to kind of babysit me and stuff like that. She only lived with us for one year because she was of a different marriage, right? But for this time, and I loved my sister Jean, just amazing influence on me. So she's in high school and she's showing me photos with her girlfriends of like little Richard and Elvis and the Everly Brothers <clears throat> and uh, all these guys. And they're all freaking out over these people. And I was like, oh, wow. And I'm three years old and I'm just watching their energy shift when an Elvis record comes on their little 45 record player and they would just, they're basically, they would hang out and listen to old rock and roll, which was new at the time. And I fell in love with it right there, you know, at age three and four. And uh, my sister Jean went on to be a a folk rock artist with her husband, Jim. They were Jim and Jean and they were on uh, a subsidiary of uh, Warner Brothers uh, records back in the day called Verve. And um, yeah, man, I used to go to their shows as a little kid and I would just be infatuated with all things music. So I love that early rock and roll. Then I love the rockabilly and the car stuff that came out of it, car music, you know, hot rod music. Um, I uh, was in love with uh, Motown when it came out. And then of course, when the Beatles arrived, (laughs) <laughs> and all of the bands uh, walked through the door that they had just opened. I, uh, you know, I really, really was, I was a goner, man. What can I say? I was smitten. Those early records by the Beatles and everyone that came after them just flipped me out. And that's when I was of an age where I could start to actually play a guitar and, you know, sit down. And first I had to learn how to tune it. I remember standing in front of my class in the fourth grade and lip syncing like a Beach Boys, a live recording of a Beach Boys session where they are stopping and starting and laughing. And I knew every cue and every laugh and every bit of dialogue. And I did that in front of my class playing guitar, but I wasn't really playing guitar. I didn't even know how to tune a guitar, but that's how it, dedicated I was to it at, at a very early age. So, uh, you know, I just... I bought the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker. And how big, like, were you like a diehard Beatle fan? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I was like, you know, millions of other kids all across the planet, crossing language barriers and cultural barriers. Uh, everyone was, was a Beatle freak when I was a kid. And it was a phenomenon. And you have to keep in mind, Hudson, that. The Beatles arrived on our stage, the Ed Sullivan show and the early 
shows they did at Shea Stadium and, and stuff like that. They arrived three months after we had lost our president, uh, John Kennedy. Yeah. And our whole country was in a, in a state of, you know, deep grief from that. And it wasn't time to have fun. We had just something very dark and difficult had just happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, here come the Beatles. And they were the first ones to give us permission to laugh and smile and party and, you know, bop our heads. And uh, I think that that probably lent itself to the incredible uh, British invasion, the adoration that we had for them is because we had been so pent up for, for months and months over this difficult time, you know. What is your favorite Beatles album? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, all things equal, I would say it would be plural. It would be um, the the White Album would probably be the one for me. Uh, followed close second by, gosh, it's a tough one between Revolver and and Rubber Soul for me. It's you know they're they're neck and neck. I go back and forth. One is very warm, and one is a little bit more brash. But uh, they're both great. You answered correctly. <laughs> That's funny. So when would you say that you realized that, um, like, in your, in, like, your, like, was it, like, through high school that you realized this is what I'm going to do for a living? I think I felt that way much earlier than that. Um, even in junior high school, I was like, this is what I'm into. This is what I want to do. To be honest with you, I know it's going to sound stupid, but I, I thought I felt that way when I was three and four years old. But of course, what do you really know at three or four years old? It's just that I, I had a desire imprinted in me that turns out I never lost. You know, that, that, was, that, was, my, that was my passion. What can I say? You know, I was, I'm a weirdo. I, I, I was sold on it. What was your like, ed did you go to like school to continue your education on musician? And did you like play guitar in like a band class in high school? Um, you know, the only education I had on guitar during my school years was I, I went away to a boarding school for one year up in Ojai, California, about two hours away from where I live now, where my brother had gone for a year. And my brother liked it, you know, you live there you ship your clothes with you and i had a green stingray bicycle and i had a guitar with me which i think was just an acoustic guitar that my sister jean had given me and um i brought it up there and was a part of uh, a, a guitar class and it was very rudimentary people just you know brand new beginners learning how to play and I was kind of already far, further along than, than the other students. So basically, I kind of just helped the teacher teach the other kids in the class. I didn't really learn anything there. It was very rudimentary, just learning all the, you know, sort of cowboy chords and shapes and stuff like that. And so, and I also had a drum set there. So I would, I was a drummer as well. And I would set, I set my drums up in an auditorium there. And I used to be able to go in there and just play whenever I wanted and just bash out, bash out your nerves. You know, it was great, great time. But so, yeah, I was in love with all kinds of music. And that, that was a, a really exciting era of music that was like 1967, 68. So think of all the great first albums that came out, like Cream, Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> blue cheer we had uh you know buffalo springfield and you know you're it's a whole new world of music that opened up for me just as i was getting proficient enough and i remember walking around the campus with my best buddy singing early dylan songs like we're like traveling minstrels he you know and uh it was so funny he would play i had a harmonica you know uh, hook on, around my neck, just like they did. It was hilarious, you know, but I, you know, what can I say? I was into it. Wow. And when did you, um, 
when did the offer to work with Etta James come about? So I had just gotten out of high school and um, it's kind of a long story, so brace yourself. That's no, okay. I had heard of this incredible artist, Etta James. And uh, I had just made friends with this guy named Phil Kaufman, a notorious uh, renegade of rock and roll. If your viewers want to look him up, it's, his story is incredible. It's insane. <laughs> they made a movie about him. Um, anyway, suffice it to say, I was uh, best friends with this guy all of a sudden. He had just lost his best friend, a guy named Graham Parsons. And um, Phil kind of took me in. You know, I was just a young kid right out of high school. Like I said, he brought me to the Troubadour, a club in Los Angeles to go see Etta James. And uh, she had just gotten out of treatment for addiction to drugs and was um, trying to rebuild her life. And here she was at uh, the Troubadour on stage with this incredible band. We watched the show and I'm just blown away, like such a great singer and next level performer. So Phil says, hey, you want to meet Etta? Because he was working with her. <laughs> so like, sure. Yeah, I'm just this little long haired kid, you know, but I'm excited. And he takes me up to the dressing room upstairs. And she was so nice to me and so warm to me. She goes, you look like a little Shetland pony. <laughs> and uh, I said, OK. Well. And then we just chatted for a little bit. And uh, a couple of months later, Phil asked me if I wanted to stay the night in his guest house and come to her rehearsal she was having uh, in Hollywood the next day. And I said, yeah, are you kidding? I'd love to. So I got in his uh, uh, equipment van, you know, and I had my old gold top Les Paul and went up there and plugged into an amp that was there and just kind of like fit in. I was so new at it, so new, so young. Um, and uh, I only had a high school band. That's all I'd done. Well, I mean, I, I had toured with uh, uh, Bobby Boris Pickett doing the Monster Mash, you know, but th that's really the extent of my, uh, of my uh, professional experience so far. And I, you know, sheepishly plugged in and started jamming along with them at this rehearsal. And it was going really well. You know, I was like, oh, my God, I'm I'm hanging with these guys, these really great musicians. And she's just killing it, sitting over on a chair over there, you know. And uh, at the end of rehearsal, she, she said to Phil, who brought me, I like that little white kid. And, uh, and uh, so she asked me if I'd like to play with her live in Long Beach the next night. And uh, that was the basically the beginning of, you know, a 30 year relationship. Yeah. So it was just one of those chance things, man, saying yes to things that scare you, you know? Yeah. Like, do you mind if I ask, like, what was the timeline until um, when did, what year was that that you started working with her? That was uh, 1973 when I met her. So I was 18. Uh, started with her. My first jam was in. Well, some time passed. It was, I was 19 when I started with her, 1974. That continued into. Uh... Oh, well, so I played in her band as her musical director and guitar player for about <laughs> 15 years. And then during that time, I also would leave to do other projects <clears throat> because she wasn't quite busy enough to keep all of us working all the time. So the band did other things as well. Let me just take a sip of water. Absolutely. I don't blame you. So yeah, she was nice enough to let me go work with other people as well. I worked with a band named Kraken. They were on Warner Brothers Records. I worked with a guy named uh, uh, Reggie Knighton and uh, would always come back to Etta after those album projects and those little tours. And I toured with the Doobie Brothers, opening for them with that band Kraken. And I uh, opened for uh, 10CC with Reggie Knighton on a national tour. And I'm out there once. Uh, and she goes, she, Etta calls me up and she goes, Brian. I go, yeah, Etta, what's going on? She goes, hey, when are you coming back? And I said, oh, we'll be back in a week. And she goes, 
okay, you come straight to Detroit because I got, I'm opening for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, I'll be right there. So I went straight to Detroit to this small theater where the Stones were playing an unannounced sort of day of the gig announced uh, small theater gig. And, uh, you know, I, you know, set up in this little theater and we rehearsed in a little side room, side room to play that night. And, you know, then we toured with the Stones uh, during some girls emotional rescue time. And that was pretty exciting. Love that album. Love yeah, that. super fun. Are you a big Stones fan too? Yeah, big Stones fan. Yeah. You know, when you're a kid, uh, the Beatles opened the door. They set the temperature. They set the expectation very high for all the new music that kept coming out of uh, the UK. And uh, second through the door that made a big splash really were the Stones. And at first I didn't really, really love it. It was a little bit scrappy for me, I guess. I was enjoying these sort of more crafted, you know, well-written pop songs that the Beatles were putting out, so catchy and clever. And, uh, you know, then the the Stones, I think, got a little bit better at songwriting and, and a little bit more interesting. Uh, they veered away from just blues covers and got more into songwriting. And so then it was a little bit more competitive with the Beatles. And then, of course, the Beatles broke up. And it happened to be right at a time when I'm now learning to play well enough. The Beatles are now off the desk. So sad. And the Stones happened to sort of embrace a more muscular sound like Sticky Fingers, uh, uh, Let It Bleed. And um, they had this new hot guitar player, you know, Mick Taylor. And as a young, you know, high schooler, this guy with this massive tone playing a Les Paul or an SG, just with this great sustain and great phrasing and great vibrato, I was really, really into it. So it's really like, you know, you eat what you are fed when you're that young. And I was now being fed the Rolling Stones because the, the Beatles had unfortunately gone their separate ways. But, you know, yeah. Now. What is your, like, if you're going to pick up and play, what guitar would you pick? Oh, usually a Les Paul, uh, you know, a vintage Gibson Les Paul. I still have the one that I played my very first rehearsal with Etta James, uh, all my shows with Etta James. And uh, I've used quite a bit with Paul as well. And I've used in the studio with Paul as well. That's my old 1957 Les Paul gold top. Wow. I got it for $850 when I was 18 years old. And I thought I'd, you know, really overpaid for it. Now, of course, it's it's worth substantially more because vintage guitar, you know. <clears throat> but that's that's my go-to sort of, or an SG. Um, I have some signature model SGs with Gibson uh, Custom Shop. And so those those are really fun to play. That's a big part of my live arsenal with Paul. Are there plans to tour? Possibly. Okay, now you're starting to travel into an area. I mean, I understand you're a journalist. You're a budding journalist who needs to know. But <clears throat> the problem is, is that I wouldn't be the one to say any news if there were plans. Um, and also there are no plans. <laughs> so there are officially no plans. Do, are you in touch with the with Paul a lot, like? You know, we had dinner a couple of months ago at his house here in Los Angeles, and that was amazing and lovely. And the food was great and the conversation was great and a lot of laughs. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we chatted about things and future plans, but, you know, we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic and it's a tough time for a larger scale uh, touring outfit like Paul's, it's 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 a challenging prospect to go play, you know, with people screaming and shouting next to each other. It's still a little bit dodgy, of course. Yeah. Now I know you came became friends with Abe before you got 
gig with Paul? Were you friends with any of the other members of the band? Yeah, the only guy I didn't know was Wix, uh, <laughs> the keyboard player, uh, our our musical director, um, and long time, longer time Paul associate. You know, Wix started with Paul in nineteen eighty nine or something. Eighty yeah, eight. Yeah, Flowers in the Dirt album. And uh, so, yeah, I was living in Silver Lake, California. I had little solo local bands going, uh, uh, still playing with Etta James. And I was playing the local clubs with my own thing as well in Los Angeles and met Rusty. And uh, we just kind of gravitated towards each other because we were both guitar slingers in Los Angeles. And we both loved to talk about gear and you know, uh, we loan each other guitars and amps and stuff like that. He was a neighbor of mine for a time. I was living with my girlfriend and uh, at the time in Silver Lake, and he was just half a mile away. So we spent a lot of good amount of time together. And as you said, became friends with Abe touring in France uh, starting in 1996. So I'd known uh, Rusty for six, seven years before that. Then Abe becomes my pal because we're touring together and, you know, there's some French guys in the band and some women in the band. And, you know, when you have a lot of days off, you want to go do something with a pal. And Abe and I sort of gravitated towards each other and go watch movies and eat junk food and go shopping and eating whatever, you know, in France, having a great time. But so Rusty and Abe had never met before. Although I knew both of them, they'd never met before until they got called by David Kahn, uh, the producer of many of Paul's albums, including that first one they worked on called uh, Driving Rain. Driving Rain is an interesting album. It is an interesting album. Yeah. I've What's your favorite Paul solo album? And I'm going to put you on the spot now. Oh. Has to be Chaos and Creation. Wow. Or nice. memory. Or memory. It's so funny because those were recorded concurrently, like at the same time. I know. And am I, I'm going to have to move into chaos sessions because you got to work with the god, Nigel Godrich. Yeah. Did him and Paul's relationship kind of diminish towards the end of the uh, recording of that album? Because I know like, with chaos, like, I, like he kind of he put a lot of pressure and was like, "This isn't a good enough." And I think it created it, it. Really sounds like a John Lennon Plastic Ono band album almost. Like, could you tell that Paul was kind of in a rough place at the time? Um, well, you know, I don't want to speak to Paul's relationships with other people. It's that's sort of not my concern. But I would say that um, we were involved in chaos at the beginning of it. And at a certain point, Nigel said he didn't want to use Paul's band. He wanted to take Paul out of his comfort circle and use his own guys. So he used the same guys that he used on sort of um, that band Air you know, used uh, a lot of the same guys that he'd gotten comfortable with. So it was clear to us as the band that Nigel wanted to make more of a Nigel sounding Paul album rather than be, um, you know, producing Paul with his current lineup. And that's that's fine. That's um, that's a producer's uh, prerogative. And I guess that was a decision that that Paul made as well. So I'm not really privy to what their relationship was like towards the end, but uh, you know, I'd be likely to probably you know stick with the rumors. <laughs> when did you first meet Paul? Oh was well, it was I didn't meet Paul until well, you know. So I got my name put forward by Abe to David Kahn, who, as I had just said, had just had produced Driving Rain. They were going to, apparently, Abe told me they were going to do some live stuff, but I didn't know what yet. And uh, he said, yeah. I said, well, who's going to play bass when he's playing guitar? 
and piano and then switch to guitar when he's playing bass. And he goes, ah, we're looking for a guitar player who plays a bit of bass. And I said, I'd love a shot at that. And <clears throat> Abe said, cool, put my name forward to David Kahn, who was putting that band together. And uh, I got a call from, uh, I got a call from David Kahn, you know, a couple of weeks after I volunteered to Abe. And uh, David Kahn said, can you come down to my studio and just hang out with me? Not Paul, just me, just wanted to hang out, talk, chat. I hadn't met David Kahn yet. So we met with him and we had a great time. He handed me a, a guitar, play a guitar while we're just chatting. Then he'd hand me a bass and play a little bass while we're chatting. And then after about 45 minutes, he said, hey, I have a good feeling about this. It's not really my call. Uh, there are other names being put forward, but you know, I have a good feeling about this. I'll put your name forward, good luck. And I get a call the next day from Paul's people saying, we'd like you to come to New Orleans to play one song at the Super Bowl with Paul McCartney. Can you be on a plane tomorrow? And I was like, what the F? Yeah. And then, so yeah, of course I said, hell yeah. And uh, so a couple of days in New Orleans to sort of uh, orient and walk off my nerves. And uh, he had a, a, uh, a dinner party set up and we all went to dinner and that was the first time I met him. He walked in the room and I could just feel the energy shift in the room and went, oh my God, here, here it goes. God help me. And anyway, so I was really nervous and really excited. And he was so lovely and so approachable and generous. And then he toasted me and the other people there at the uh, dinner. And it was just, you know, that was it. Then we had a one day of rehearsal. And then we did a uh, a song called Freedom that was on Driving Rain uh, for a pregame show. Uh, and that was my first experience with Paul, my audition for a billion people. And nope. you obviously passed. No big deal, right? Yeah. Anyway, very, very fun times. And, uh, you know, when that performance ended and the game ended, I thought I'll probably never see Paul again, but let me go thank him. So we're watching the game. And I think it was the Eagles against the Patriots. I'm not positive. I think that's but, right. And um, so I'm saying goodbye to Paul. We're still watching the game. We're in the fourth quarter. Game was incredible. <clears throat> and he said, well, thank you, Brian. Very nice to meet you too. Thank you very much. And then somebody said, hey, we're going back to the hotel. Come down and have a drink at the bar. I didn't know Paul was gonna be there or not. I come down to the bar at the hotel in New Orleans. And there's Paul playing like Lady Madonna for the whole bar. And I went like, this dude is so cool. Anyway, so we're sitting around after that chatting and uh, yeah, that went on for a good hour or so. And then at a certain point he got up to, to leave uh, and uh, he's going around the sort of eight or 10 of us, whoever was there and giving everyone a hug and saying goodbye. And then he comes and gives me a hug and he goes, okay, Brian, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'll see you in six weeks for rehearsal. And he said, stick with Abe and Rusty. They'll show you the ropes. And I turned to Abe and I said, did he just say what I think he said? And he goes, yeah, dude. So, you know, that, that was it. You know, I ran home and started to uh, practice. And five weeks later, I was in a room with Paul McCartney playing his, uh, his great catalog of songs, solo and wings and Beatles and all of it. Are you doing any backup vocals with him? Because I know Abe does some of it. Oh, yeah, we all sing. Wow. Yeah. You have the luckiest job in the world. Uh, I know, it's true. Do you think, um, does Paul really, like, what is Paul's reaction when, like, what do you, like, does he, do you think he prefers doing studio work or do you think he really prefers touring? You know, he's like, in my opinion, he's like a lot of us. They're very different things. Studio work is something you just indulge your wildest fantasies and make them 
real and then they last forever. It's insane. It's such a fun pursuit. It's like dreaming a picture and then just going and painting it like in an hour. Of course, it takes more than an hour, but it's this incredible process where you can literally um, to use that metaphor, paint a picture any way you want. They're like three, three and a half minute movies for the mind, you know? Um, and it's such an exciting thing, but they also don't give you that intense uh, immediate gratification that touring gives you when you see people like screaming and crying and waving and singing along. There's nothing that gives you that, certainly not the studio. That's a very insular, capsulized, situation they're very different they're the opposite uh, experiences wow do you think um would you mind telling us about what you've been doing with the bayonets recently okay so the bayonets uh, uh is a, a side band that i formed with oliver lieber is a great singer uh, more songwriter than singer multi-instrumentalist producer and, you know, he'd been a collaborator with me on my solo stuff for many years. My first album, Mondo Magneto, my second one, This Way Up. He'd written several songs with me along the way, mostly just lyrics. Like I'd call him up when I was in a bind, like, help me out with this verse. And then we'd kind of rewrite all of the lyrics, you know, often on the phone. And we'd have so much fun doing it, having a lot of laughs. So it was time for me to do a third album. And I came to Oliver and I said, Hey, uh, so he goes, I would, I really want to play and write, but he said, what, why don't we do a band instead? And I went, okay. And that was that simple. So we formed a band right then and there, we decided what the, what the sort of uh, musical identity would be. How would it be different from my solo kind of rock pop power pop stuff? And we kind of designed this, you know, sonic, you know, imprint of this, uh, of this new project. And we just started writing and recording that day. And we recorded, we were going to, re we were going to release one song every eight weeks. We released our first one and Maureen Van Zant, actress and also a uh, wife of Stevie Van Zant, uh, she discovered our first release just on Twitter or Facebook or wherever. And she played it for her husband, Stevie Van Zant of uh, Bruce Springsteen Needs Street Band and of The Sopranos and Lily Hammer. And uh, he has a radio show, a radio station, and he has a record label. And I always thought his record label was the coolest label in the world. Of course, it's even called cool. It's called Wicked Cool Records. Anyway, uh, she goes, I, she reached out to me on Twitter and goes, Brian, I played your, your new record for my husband and he flipped out and he loves it and he wants to email you, send me your email address. So I get an email from him the next day going like, who the hell is the Bayonets? Where can I get more? What are you doing? I love this song. I'm gonna do an edit. You can use the edit or not, but I'm gonna play it on my radio show a lot. And, uh, and I answered him back when like, God, thank you so much. And, and he said, you might want to slow your roll a little bit on this release date, because I'm a big fan and I'll play your records. So he did. And gosh, you know, that we worked that album for about four years, just because of his support, you know, one song after another. And uh, more recently, uh, Oliver and I got together to write another song. So we were on hiatus for a long time as I went out on tour with Paul. I did some more solo stuff. I got a solo deal on Wicked Cool while we were on hiatus with the Bayonets. And more recently, we, we've, uh, we've been doing a little bit of writing. This is first time anybody's heard that. You're breaking the news like an intrepid reporter. I cannot wait. Brian, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Coming on the show. Where can the listeners find you and buy your music? Okay, so now I'm rebuilding my website right now. So you'll see that's under construction, but that's brianray.com. Get ready because there will be a new site there soon. 
Uh, but you can find my music wherever you buy digital music or wherever you stream your digital music, or you can find um, hard copies of my uh, CDs that I've put out before, if you prefer that sort of thing at, you know, wherever you get your albums. Um, and there's vinyl singles in, in record stores from my solo, uh, my solo pursuits with Wicked Cool Records. And you can go to Wicked Cool Records. Find me there. Thank you so much, Brian. You're so welcome. Thanks so much, Hudson.